Hello, everybody. So I'm going to do a really quick update about what's going on in Ukraine and Russia, specifically considering the fact that I am actually in the process of moving. So I just turn this. I'm in France right now. I think we get information faster than you guys do in the US, obviously by proximity. So what's going on? I don't have time to throw up a bunch of pictures. So all my sources are in the description box below. But essentially, look, Yevgeny, the head of, of the Wagner group. Now he had struck a deal. He allegedly is going to go to Belarus. Now his team though, they are still going back to Ukraine. And the question is what specifically did he say? What is the relationship that he has with Putin? What's going to happen in the future? Well, first I want to read you a quote that he had said, quote, we are patriots of our motherland. We fought in our fighting. He said in audio messages, and no one is going to turn themselves in at the request of the president, the FSB, Russia's domestic intelligence service, or anyone else. We went with a march of justice. We were attacked from the beginning by artillery and then by helicopters, and we passed without a single shot. We did not touch a single conscript. We didn't kill a single person along the way. So obviously he's trying to give himself an out here. I don't think that's true at all because they shot down allegedly three different helicopters, according to him. So unless all these people miraculously survived, which I, I highly doubt it. So he's not willing to take any orders from Putin, but at the same time, he's not willing to resist. What happened? Well, one of the ideas was that Belarus has a joint military operation with the Russian government. What essentially that means is that if Moscow were trying, if somebody tried to take over Moscow, the Belarusian government would send their troops over. So even though Moscow had their, whatever it was, the equivalent of the uh, National Guard, they're historically under-trained and under-equipped. And as a result of that, it's uh, who really knows if they're going to actually be able to fight the Wagner Group, or to what extent they are. The Wagner Group is believed to be 25,000. They're originally about 40,000, but a lot of them had died as a result. So what's going to happen with Yevgeny? Well, one, obviously nobody knows, but two, the best guess is he's probably going to be unalived because most of the oligarchs at this point had been unalived when they crossed Putin. So I'm gonna read some of the different individuals who had crossed Putin at some point. These individuals were either in the military or the oil sectors, generally speaking. But we have, and I'm gonna butcher the names, but if we look at Ivan Petrin, who fell off his yacht and unalived, Anatoly Jeroshenko fell off or fell down some stairs, excuse me, Ravil Maganov, who fell out of a hospital window, Boris Berezovsky, who may have uh, theoretically hung himself, Alexander Tulyakov, who hung himself, and Mikhail Wadford, who hung himself. All these people crossed Putin, and they all had been unalived as a result. Now, Putin is not afraid to have unaliving individuals in other countries as well. And he just tried that not too long ago in the UK. And also, I just realized this is some weird lighting. Sorry guys, bear with me here. So he's not opposed to doing anything like that as well. So what do we think about Yev Yevgeny? Well, the Wagner group is believed to be going to continue to exist to some capacity, but they are also allowed to go back into the Russian military. Now, I don't know after the Ukraine war what's going to happen with them. And Yevgeny, I mean, he's allegedly in Belarus, but he's going to be living underneath a brutal individual who's friends with Putin. So how long does he live for? I don't know. But can we expect him to be unalived as well? Yes. Second story I have, if you guys are watching the full video. Zelensky, what is his comments with all of this? Well, he says that this situation with Wagner shows the stupidity of Russia. I'm going to read you his quote. It's a bit complicated. Again, you can find it in the, the description box below. If you're watching this as a separate video, sources description box below. I don't have a lot of time because I'm moving right now out of France, ironically. I want to sh show you guys what Zelensky is saying and why is he saying what he's saying. But he's essentially, his comments are on Twitter. It's his actual Twitter account, 7 million followers, been confirmed by The Hill. And he's going to be discussing how this is a representation of the internal conflict and what Putin's scared of. Very interesting. Here's what he says, quote, for a long time, Russia used propaganda to mask its weaknesses and stupidity of its government. And now there's so much chaos that no lie can hide it. And all of this is one person who again and again scares by the year 1917. I believe he meant is scared by the year 1917, which I'll get into in a second. Although he is able to result in nothing else but this. Okay. Is it true? Of course. Of course it's true. Now, why does Zelensky say Putin is scared of 1917? Well, because Putin himself has mentioned continually the year 1917. What happened in 1917? 
Well, before I get to that, let me read you what Putin said, and then I'll get to that. I need more context. Quote, he's discussing the Wagner Group. It's a stab in the back of our country and our people. Exactly this strike, the Wagner Group, was dealt in 1917 when the country was in World War I, but its victory was stolen. Another quote, Intrigues and arguments behind the army's back turned out to be the greatest catastrophe, destruction of the army and the state, loss of huge territories resulting in tragedy and civil war. So what happened in 1917 that he keeps, he's referenced now, he's referenced in the past. Zelensky said, look, he's scared because it's like 2000, or <laughs> 1917. This shows there's turmoil like there was then. So 1917, Putin is comparing himself to the situation of Tsar Nicholas II. Tsar Nicholas II was fighting World War I. There was an internal upheaval that would have led, well, not allegedly, it would eventually turn into the Bolshevik Revolution that would be led by Lenin and the creation of the Soviet Union, which would eventually fall and obviously Putin would take power after that. So he's comparing his situation with World War I. He claims that like Tsar Nicholas II, who failed in World War I as a result of internal upheaval between competing powers vying for influence. Similarly, he's saying that Russia might lose the Ukraine war as a result of the Wagner Group's irresponsibility. What was really interesting about this is that even though the Bolshevik Revolution, I am not an expert at this, but I do know a little bit about it. The Bolshevik Revolution, right? Individuals rose up against the government. Now, Putin tried to control as many aspects of the Russian government as possible to at least minimize the amount of leverage that a group could have against him if they were to rise up as a revolution. So it's not exactly apples to apples comparison, but what he has done throughout his political career to ensure that something like this doesn't happen was he would take his childhood friends, individuals he has relationships with, and he would put them at the top of industries. So instead of having billionaires that he would have to be friends with, he had friends that he be, who he made into billionaires, one of which was Yevgeny who allegedly was one of the individuals who had worked at the, the restaurant, the catering service for Kremlin, and somehow transitioned into the orators or the, the creators or the managers of the Wagner Group. And you might be wondering, why would Yevgeny, who is a, a food service worker, why would he be the one chosen for military affairs? Unless something was a front. Maybe the food service was a front. Regardless, Putin had put him in power because he was believed to be trusted. Now, this isn't the first time Putin had done this, like I'd said. There's other individuals, Arkady Rottenberg, who he was an old friend and judo partner of Putin who ended up creating the bridge to Crimea, multi-billion dollar enterprise. And this guy was a multi-billion air construction worker because of Putin. You have other people as well, Sergei Chemezov, who eventually controlled the private military industries. Allegedly, he had connections with Putin during the KGB. And you have Igor Sechin. I probably butchered all these names. I apologize. He is the CEO of the state-owned company Rosneft. They're the ones that control the oil in Russia. So these are things that he had done to try to control the different industries that could give teeth to any sort of revolution. Again, the Bolshevik revolution was a little different, but the concerns that he had about 1917 are the concerns that he's worried about for himself today. And what we've seen is that when people try to turn on him, he unalives them. I don't know what I'm allowed to say, so I'm going to keep saying unalive. He doesn't unalive them. So do we think Yevgeny has any sort of way of surviving this? I don't see how he would, frankly. Because even if he's in the Belarusian government, which they're friends with Putin, you don't think Putin's going to want to take his hat off as a representation, an example? He's already unalived the other oligarchs, so, well, not all of them, you know a lot of them. Why wouldn't he do the same with Yevgeny? I think I keep saying Yevgeny. Yevgeny. So look, man, Putin's greatest fear, do I think it's going to ever happen? No. Do I think he's right to be scared? Yes. Is Zelensky correct that this is a good representation of all the political turmoil that's going on that is repressed by the media and also shines a light on what Putin's actually scared of. Yeah. Let's see what happens to Evgeny.